Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for your presence in this house, God. Lord, what a joy it is to lift our hands and our voices to you, God, and just build ourselves up in your presence, God. Thank you, Lord, for what you've already done in this church service, God. We pray, Lord, as we open up your word, you open it up to us. Give us eyes that see, ears that hear, hearts that have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. May it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives, God. We pray, Father God, that you send your Holy Spirit now to be our teacher, be our guide. Come and give us the vision, the wisdom, the direction we need, the motivation, even the instruction, the correction, the discipline for our lives, Lord. We love it and we receive it, Father. And Father God, we pray not this blessing just on ourselves, but also upon all of our brothers and sisters here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. There are brothers and sisters, Lord, no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building one kingdom, and that's yours. So God, we'd ask that you bless all of our brothers and sisters, bless our Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Father, we thank you for Calvary Chapel and Harvest, Oak Valley, God, for the well and the way. God, for Ecclesia and Emmanuel Baptist and Trinity, God, all the great churches that are out there, God, for the four-square denomination, Lord, for the Assemblies of God, and for our Catholic and Adventist brothers and sisters, Lord, those that are lifting up the name of Jesus this day, God. We bless them as you would bless us. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, we say, amen. 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 Today, get your Bibles out and go with me to the book of Hebrews, the ninth chapter. We're going to be reading in Hebrews 9, and start in verse 1 and read through verse number Five. Today, the title of the message is The Testimony of Our Heart. We're going to find out what that means as we go through the Word of God. Now listen, as we go through these verses, you're going to notice that it's talking about some concepts from the Old Testament, from the Old Covenant. Very important that we understand that as we read through these verses, it's giving us a type and a shadow of something that has happened in the past. And the author of Hebrews in chapter 8 has just introduced to us the new covenant, what the difference is, the new realities, the new things that are coming on. And now he's going to contrast that with what was happening in the old covenant. See, everything speaks. As you look in the Bible, everything speaks. This is speaking to us about our life, speaking to us about our King, our, our Messiah, our Savior, our High Priest, Jesus. And so... Very important that as we look at these things, that we don't just kind of yawn or sit back and wonder, you know, maybe this is talking about something I need to know, or maybe it's just information, but rather get a hold of the heartbeat of God. I believe that as you get a hold of these things, that you're going to understand and get a greater picture of who God is, of his desires, of his will, of his character. And as you do that, you will have a deeper relationship with Jesus, and you walk out of this place built up and encouraged in faith. Hebrews chapter 9 Starting in verse 1, we're going to read through verse number 5. Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 1 said, Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. Now, I want you to notice something. He's talking about the first covenant, talking about the old covenant, right? And it says that it had ordinances of divine service. There was a sacrificial system and there was a daily service that the priests had to do under this old covenant. And it talks about the earthly sanctuary. See, there was a tabernacle or a tent here on the earth that was set up that housed the presence of God at that time and that was the place and the center of the camp to where they would come and they would worship God and they would make atonement for sin. And so there was something that God is showing us that this is an earthly picture of a heavenly reality. Verse number two. For a tabernacle was prepared. That's the tent we were just talking about. The first part in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, or some of your translations say the holy place, okay? And so here was a place where the priest could come in, and they would do a daily service. They had to tend to the candles there on the, on the lampstand. They had to tend to the wicks and make sure that there was oil that was feeding that lamp, make sure that they were lit. Because there was no other lamp in that room, and this was inside the tent. Therefore, that lampstand provided light all around. Also, they had a table that had the showbread. There were 12 pieces of bread, six on each side, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. That bread also had to be warm. It had to be replaced once a week, and it was set there before the Lord. It had wine with it, and speaking to us in our lives, talking about communion, talking about our fellowship with the Lord. Let's read on. It says, and behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. Everybody say the holiest of all. Holy See, now this was a place that was also called the holy of holies or holiness of holiness. This was the place where there was a large, thick, impenetrable veil that separated these two chambers inside of the tabernacle, inside of the tent. 
And in that first part, the priest could come in daily and do their ministry before the Lord. But that second part, only the high priest could go in. He could only enter in once a year and not without the blood of a sacrifice. And he would go into that place and he would make atonement for the sin of the people. Atonement means a covering. It covered the sins of the people for that year. Verse number four. And it starts to de describe what was there in that holiest of all, the holy of holies. Verse number four says, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded and the tablets of the covenant. Verse number five, and above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Now the author of Hebrews did not have time to speak in detail about all of these things. And I kind of find it humorous that in, later on in the, in the book, he says, I've just written to you a short letter, even though it's one of the longest epistles that we have in the New Testament, right? So it wasn't necessarily that this was unimportant or that he had to skip over it. It is important, and it was something that he could have described for us. However, remember Hebrews chapter 8, verse number 1, this is the main point of the things which are, we are saying, is that we have a high priest, and so he says, I, I can't get distracted pulling out all the truths from this right now because there's a main point, there's a flow of the Holy Spirit that God is carrying us on and taking us on, and we don't really have time right now to discuss this. However, today we're going to discuss these things because we have a little bit of time together, and we're going to find out what it is that the Lord is speaking because the Lord thought it important enough to include it in the text. Therefore, we shouldn't just shine it on or just skip over it and just say, oh, that's just you know, Old Testament ceremonial law or sacrificial system or just information for us to know what it looked like there in the most holy place. No, this is for our lives today. You ever wondered when you're reading your Bible, ever thought, you know, God, why did you make this book so thick? Anybody other than Pastor Dan ever thought that, you know? Like, you're reading the Old Testament, and, and you're reading through, and you're kind of wondering, God, do I really need to know who begat who, who begat who, who begat who, who begat who? I mean, that goes on and on and on. There's chapters dedicated to genealogies in the Old Testament. God, did I really need to know every stone on the garments of the high priest? Did I really need to know the colors? Did I really need to know that there's pomegranates on the pillars with chain? I mean, God, you're, you're telling me what kind of wood they made the beams out of, God. Yeah, anybody other than Pastor Dan wondered why God would take so much time in the Bible describing these things in the Old Testament? See, God is doing something. God is saying something. Everything speaks. And as we take a look at the word of God, we find out more and more about God. The Bible says that all of creation speaks, that the heavens declare the glory of God, that if we stayed silent, the rocks would cry out. Everything speaks. And therefore, when you take a look at the tabernacle, you take a look at this tent, you find out something about God. John chapter 1, verse 1, you know that in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Therefore, we find out that the word is Jesus. Jesus is the living word of God. John chapter 1, verse 14 comes along. We'll put it up on the overheads. And it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, you might be scratching your head thinking, Pastor Dan, hold on. We were just talking about the tabernacle. Now you flipped over to the word became flesh. What are we doing here? See that word dwelt up there? I've highlighted it for you up on the overheads. Everybody say dwell. dwell. If you take a look at that word dwelt and you translate it literally from the original language, it means to set up tabernacle. Oh, now all of a sudden our eyes light up. Why? Because the word became flesh. Jesus came robed in flesh and did something. He dwelt among us. The word Jesus came and set up tabernacle among us. So when we see the tabernacle now, we no longer see just a tent in the wilderness. We no longer see the Old Testament sacrificial system. Now we see Jesus. The Word became flesh who dwelt among us, who tabernacled among us. So when we take a look at this, now all of a sudden we understand why God spent so much time in the Old Testament describing these things. Why? Because can you describe God, creator of the heavens and the earth, this magnificent, almighty God, the one who is unsearchable, whose wealth is, is just inexplainable, who is God over all, God over creation, God over our hearts and our lives, the redemptive God, the one who went to the cross. Can you describe him or understand him in the Cliff Notes version? Hello? Does God describe himself in a blog or a pamphlet? No. 
That's why God had to take so much time describing these things is because he was giving us his calling card. He was giving us a picture of who he is, showing us his character, showing us his nature, showing us his attributes. God is telling us that this is who I am, this is how I operate, this is what I do, and you will know me when you know this. problem is, in our society, we want everything microwaved, right? I want it in three minutes. I want a full hot meal in five minutes. I want it now. I want it my way. I want it in 30 seconds or it's free. Uh, you know, see, we've got all this instant stuff. Instant coffee, instant milk, instant everything. It just all is there. Drive through Christianity. And we want God to download us everything in a matter of seconds. And yet God is saying, this is going to take a lifetime. And even after that lifetime, you're still going to say, after everything I know, I still am just scratching the surface of how great and how awesome and how mighty my God is. So we take a look at the tabernacle and we see Jesus, the word of God. We see that now, no longer does God dwell in a house made with hands, but now God has chosen to live in our hearts. So the tabernacle, yes, is a picture of Jesus, but now Jesus has gone to the Father and he sent his spirit to live in our hearts. Now Christ is in us, and we become the tabernacle, the dwelling place of Almighty God. Are you listening today? So that means when you see what's in the tabernacle, you see what's in you. Now, I'm going to make a statement I'm going to put up on the overheads for you. For those of you that are taking notes, you can write this down if you like. Here's the statement. What's in your heart is a testimony of where you're at with God. What's in your heart is a testimony of where you are at with God. Let me give you an example of this. If I had a cup right here in my hand, and I filled that cup up with sweet juice, and then I took that cup and I gave it a squeeze... What would come out of the cup? Okay, three of you know the answer. This is not a hard question, guys. <laughs> Help me out here, okay? If I put sweet juice in a cup and I squeezed that cup, what would come out of it? Juice, juice right? Coffee's not going to come out. Soda's not going to come out. Water's not going to come out. Why? Because what you put in is what you will get out. In the same way, what's in our heart is a testimony of where we are at with God. If you put God in, when life comes and gives you a squeeze, what's going to come out of you? God is. Why? Because what you put in is what you will get out. If life comes along and gives you a squeeze and the high school words come out, maybe you've been putting the wrong things in. Maybe you've been watching the wrong movies. Maybe you've been hanging out with the wrong friends. Because what you put in is what you will get out. God in, God out. What's in your heart is a testimony of where you're at with God. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And a man thinks in his heart, so is he. See, what's in your heart is a testament of where you're at with God. So we see the Ark of the Covenant, representative of our hearts. It's the throne of God. It's the only seat in the entire tabernacle. Nowhere else could anybody sit down. This was representative of the throne of God. And it talks about there was two angels, and the cherubim that spread their wings over the Ark on the mercy seat, the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. And this represented the throne of God, and above it, was the glory of God. You may have heard it called the Shekinah glory of God. No illumination, there was no light in that most holy place, the Holy of Holies, just the presence of God which illuminated it because God is light. And when God on his throne looked down, he saw three items in that ark that represented three things in our hearts. Now today I gotta warn you about something, is that okay? I gotta warn you, this mess is gonna make you feel guilty. But then it's gonna make you feel good, okay? 
So it's okay because a godly sorrow leads to repentance, which leads to eternal life. So we're going to make you feel guilty a little bit today, but that's all right. Don't think pastor's getting down on you because at the end, we're going to feel good. Because when you see yourself, you realize how dirty you are and you start to feel guilty. And you say, God, I'm a man of unclean lips. I've got unclean hands. And yet when you see God as he is and you see yourself and feel guilty, now when you take a look at God, God comes to you like that angel with the coal of fire and says, see, I have made you clean. And you can say, here I am, Lord, send me. Three atoms that the Ark of the Covenant held. Three atoms that the Ark of the Covenant held. First one we see was the jar of manna. The jar of manna. Very familiar story, Exodus chapter 16. Go there with me, Exodus. Second book of the Bible, right after Genesis, you'll find Exodus. Go to Exodus chapter number 16. In Exodus chapter 16... The Lord has delivered the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, and now they are coming out. And as they're coming out, they notice something. My tummy's rumbling. I'm hungry. We've been walking a long time. And all of a sudden, you know what happens. They start to complain. Say, did God bring us out here in the wilderness to starve us to death? I mean, come on now. At least back in Egypt, we had meat to eat. You know, we had stuff that we could eat back there in Egypt. And they started desiring the food of Egypt, and they start complaining. And they say, hey, Moses, you know, we've been walking a long time, and we're all hungry. And where are you at? And, and, and what's God doing right now? Did he bring us out here? And they start to complain. And God says, whoa, 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 whoa. wait a second. Time out. We're not doing this. We're not doing this. Exodus chapter number 16, verse number 11 and verse number 12 say this. Exodus chapter 16, starting verse number 11. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, verse number 12, I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Speak to them saying, at twilight you shall eat meat and in the morning you shall be filled with bread and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So what does God do at night? He causes the wind to blow through the camp and now here come the quail. There's the meat that they can eat. And at night, during the nighttime, a little mist falls on the camp, a little, little dew comes down on the camp. Children of Israel come outside, and they see it all covering the ground. And they say, what is it? Translated the original language, manna. Manna, what is it? Manna, what is it? So they go and they gather it up and they could boil it, they could bake it, they could eat it, whatever, you know, they probably had manna flakes and, you know, manna this, manna that, manna bread mix and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, kind of like Gilligan's Island, how they made everything out of coconuts, you know, there's kind of that same thing, but only with manna, you know, they had manna everything. And so here are the children of Israel and they gathered it up and, and, and every day they had to go out and they gathered it up. If they tried to keep it overnight, it grew worms and it stank. Moses got mad at him. What are you guys doing? You're trying to be a little hoarder? Listen, you think God's not miraculous? God's not going to take care of you tomorrow? But there was a problem on the sixth day. They had to gather twice as much because on the seventh day, they could do no work. And so God was saying, I want you to rest. So gather a double portion on the sixth day so that on the seventh day, you can rest. So they would gather it up. But remember, if they tried to keep it overnight, it would grow worms and stink. Except on the sixth day, God would cause a miracle to happen. And he would sustain that double portion that second portion for the seventh day so that they could eat it wouldn't stink and no worms. Wow, pretty amazing stuff when you think about it. The Bible tells us that he who gathered little didn't gather too little, and he who gathered much didn't gather too much, but it was sufficient for each and every day. So the Lord says to Moses, Moses, I want you to do something. I want you to do something for me. Exodus chapter 16, verse 33, and verse number 34. Drop down to verse number 33. Verse number 34, Moses said to Aaron, take a pot and put an omer of manna in it. So measure it out and put it in the pot. Lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations. Verse 34, as the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony. Everybody say testimony. Testimony. See, we're talking about the testimony of your heart. And Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. See, what was God speaking? God was saying that as he sits on his throne and he looks down at our hearts, there is a testimony about his provision for our lives. That God will take care of our needs and yet complaints came up against him. And therefore, that jar was kept there in the testimony, in the Ark of the Covenant for their generations. Why? To show us that we had rejected God's provision. That was what was in our hearts. That jar of manna symbolized a rejection of God's provision. See, don't you think that God, who is the creator of the heavens and the earth, he speaks and planets exist. 
just delivered the nation of Israel, parted the waters of the Red Sea, took out the greatest known army on the face of the planet with one swipe of his hand over the waters and just drowned them all. If God did all that, do you think that God knew that they were hungry? Do you think that God knew that they needed something to eat and something to drink? And let's go a step further. This miraculous God who can cause quail to come into the camp and the bread of angels to fall down out of the sky and feed the people. Do you think that God could have, if he wanted to, sustained their bodies through their travels in the wilderness? Yes, he could have. Think about it. Moses went up on the mountain 40 days, 40 nights, didn't have anything to eat, nothing to drink. Now, you could survive with food for that long, without food for that long, but you cannot survive without water for that long. That means that there was a miracle that took place. The presence of God was sustaining the body of Moses. Therefore, the presence of God would have sustained the children of Israel. They didn't need to eat or drink. Yet their appetites were leading them to complain. And what was in their hearts came out of their mouths. In the same way, oftentimes, we wonder about God. God, what are you doing? God, I don't know what you're doing. God, I don't know what's happening here. Lord, this job is just not enough. God, I'm not getting paid enough. Lord, I don't know what you're doing over here. God, I got the bills lining up and I just lost the house. And, you know, it looks like they're doing layoffs again, God. And we start to complain, God, am I, am I going to have enough? Our appetites lead us. Lord, I don't have enough. God, I can't be like them. God, I can't buy the cars. I can't buy the house. I can't buy the clothes. And yet God is saying, don't worry. Don't worry, I will sustain you. I will take care of you. Gather it up. Get enough because he who gathered little didn't gather too little. See, you get some of the Lord in your side. Get some of God. If you just got a little peace, that'll be enough for your day. And if you can get all as much as you can of God, it will never be too much. If God wants us to rest in him, in his provision. Second item that we find in the ark, the second item that we find was Aaron's staff that had butted. Aaron's staff that had budded. Now, the children of Israel are traveling. They're wandering the wilderness. You want to turn with me to the book of Numbers. Numbers, chapter number 17. Go from Exodus through Leviticus to the book of Numbers, chapter number 17. As they're wandering in the wilderness, there's a guy by the name of Korah and his family. And they come up against Moses. And they say, who, who made you the leader? I'm just sick of this. What is this nepotism, you and Aaron and Miriam and all this kind? Of, I'm just done. Who made you the leader? I want to be the leader. And so he gathers people to himself, and Moses says, uh-uh, no, this is not happening. It, listen, you want to know who the Lord has chosen? God's going to do a new thing. He's going to open up the ground, and the earth will swallow up the rebellious people, and it will close up behind them. So he commands the children of Israel, get away from them if you don't want to be swallowed up. If you're not in this rebellion, stand back and watch what the Lord will do. The ground opens up underneath Korah, his family, and all the rebels and their families, and it swallows the people up, the, 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 the men, the women, the children. It swallows their animals up, all their livestock, all their tents, all their goods, and then <laughs> closes right up behind them. If I would have been there watching that, and I was a part of the nation of Israel, and I looked and there was Moses saying the ground was going to open up, and there was Korah, the ground opened up and swallowed him, I'd have been like, hey Moses, do you need your car washed? I'm available today, tomorrow, what, what, you need your shoes shine? I got this man, oh wait, 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 uh, no, I'll gather the manna, you just, you just sit down, okay, I got your manna for you today, tomorrow too, right? That's just me. That's just me. I would have been right there beside Moses. Not so with the children of Israel. We find out that after that happened, they start to cry. They start to complain. What was in their heart came up out of them, and they started to say, Woe is us, or God's going to kill us all, and who made Moses the leader? And God says, Enough! I'm done. I don't want anybody else to die. Go get the leaders of the tribes. I want you to take from each of the heads of the tribe their staff, their rod signified their authority over that house. And I want you to gather them up and put them before the tent of meeting. Overnight, I want you to write their names, whoever's stick it is, write their name on it, okay? Carve it out, whatever you gotta do. Make sure that you know whose staff is whose. In the morning, I will show you who the leader is that I have chosen, okay? Now look at what happens. Exodus, I'm sorry, Numbers chapter number 17. Numbers chapter number 17, look at verse number eight. 
Numbers chapter 17, verse number 8. Now it came to pass on the next day that Moses went into the tabernacle of witness. And behold, the rod of Aaron of the house of Levi had sprouted and put forth buds, had produced blossoms and yielded ripe almonds. Now, in case there was any question in the children of Israel's mind, God didn't just cause the rod to sprout. That would have been enough. But just in case somebody said, oh, that's not a sprout. Yeah, what are you crazy? That was already there. It put forth buds. Now, we would have thought, that's good enough. But no, 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 no. God said not just buds. It had produced blossoms. And just in the event that somebody was dumb enough to come and say, well, you know, Aaron's wife, she really is good with flowers and stuff like that. And she made that happen. What did he do? It yielded ripe almonds. See, God is telling us something that, number one, he does not do anything halfway. And that you don't have to wonder about his direction and his leadership in your life. That God has selected leadership. God has chosen to show us the direction. And God is our authority. And God is the one who sets up authority in our lives. So we understand and we see that God was telling them something. Numbers chapter 17, verse 10. Take a look at it with me. And the Lord said to Moses, bring Aaron's rod back before the testimony. Everybody say the testimony because we're talking about the testimony of our hearts. Bring Aaron's rod back before the testimony to be kept as a sign against the rebels that you may put their complaints away from me lest they die. See those last three words up there? Lest they die. In other words, God's judgment, God is holy. God is the righteous judge. And as those complaints were coming up and that rejection was coming up and that rebellion was coming up, what happened to Korah? Ground opened up, ground closed up. They were dead. God is merciful, so much so that he didn't even want the rebels to die, so he set that up there before the testimony, because this symbolized something. It symbolized a rejection of God's leadership. Aaron's staff that had butter symbolized a rejection of God's leadership. So there, as God looked down from the throne, what did he see? He saw a rejection of his provision, a rejection of his leadership, and finally, what did he see? He saw the tablets of stone, tablets of the covenant. The Ten Commandments. This is a pretty easy one. But turn there with me. You're there in Numbers. Turn the next book to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter number 10. Let's take a look at it. Deuteronomy chapter number 10. You know the story. Maybe you've seen the movie. Moses goes up on the side of the mountain. What happens? God carves out tablets of stone, writes the Ten Commandments on them. Moses grabs the Ten Commandments. Now, Moses doesn't know this, but while he's gone, the people start to complain once again. People start to rebel once again. What happens? They go to Aaron. They say, Aaron, we don't know about where this Moses guy has been. You know, we don't know what happened to him. But listen, he's gone now, and we need you to lead us. We need you to, uh, you know, make new gods for us that brought us out of Egypt. We'll worship those gods. So Aaron says, give me all your gold. They give him his gold. What does he do? He fashions a, a cow, and they start to worship a golden cow that Aaron had made that they said, this is the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Then they rise up to party, and they have this wicked party, and while Moses is coming down, he starts to realize something's gone wrong. In fact, Joshua said there's a war in the camp, and Moses says, no, that's not the sound of war. Something else altogether is going on. They go down there and they find the people engaged in all sorts of filth, all sorts of wickedness. Moses gets mad. The Lord stops it. Moses goes. He grinds up the cow. He puts it in the water. He makes them drink it. I mean, they really had to eat their mistakes that day. Are you listening? Moses goes back up before the Lord. And the Lord says, I want you this time. You, Moses, hew out the tones of tablets of stone. And I want you to bring them up. God writes with his finger once again the Ten Commandments on it. And then take a look at this. Moses is preaching to the people, telling them about what has happened during their time of the Exodus. And in Deuteronomy chapter number 10, starting in verse number 3, we'll read through verse number 5. Deuteronomy chapter 10, starting in verse number 3, says this. So I made an ark of acacia wood, hewed two tablets of stone like the first, and went up the mountain, having the two tablets in my hand. Verse 4. And he, speaking of God, capital H, wrote on the tablets, according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments which the Lord had spoken to you in the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them to me. Verse 5, Then I turned and came down from the mountain and put the tablets in the ark which I had made. And there they are, just as the Lord commanded me. Now, I want you to notice something. The children of Israel did not need the tablets in order to know what the law of God was because God had spoken it to them from the midst of the fire in the mountain. They had heard the word of God. They knew the law of God. The tablets were just there as a reminder. 
So now that he has the new tablets, he lays them in the ark. Why? Because there was a testimony that came out of these people's hearts that they had rejected God's laws. Ten commandments there in the ark of the covenant before the Lord in a testimony symbolized a rejection of God's law. So we see three items that were there in the ark, three items that were in our hearts. There was a rejection of God's leadership, a rejection of God's provision, and a rejection of God's laws. Now thank God that he is a merciful God and he is speaking to us about this because that's not the end of the story because without the lid to the ark, God will look down, see that rejection, that rebellion, and he would have to bring judgment upon us. We would all die separated from God in our sins. And yet, there was a mercy seat that was placed on top of the ark that changes that seat from one of judgment to one of mercy. And that's why they had the Day of Atonement. Atonement, remember, means covering. They had to make a covering for sin. The high priest would take blood. He would slay an animal. He would catch that blood in the basin. They would burn up the flesh of that animal, and then he would go in before the Lord. And as he went in before the Lord, he would go into the presence of God one day a year, the Day of Atonement, and he would sprinkle the blood before the Lord there on the mercy seat seven times, seven being the number of perfection. He would make a perfect atonement, a perfect covering for sin for that year, for his sins and for the sins of the people. But remember, this man, this high priest, was not a perfect man, and therefore he could not stay in the presence of God. His sin was only covered, and he would have to leave the presence of God and could not sit down because he had finished the work, and he could not rest because the work was never done. Now, this word mercy seat, we find it two times in the Bible. Just two. Once here in the book of Hebrews, when it's describing the tabernacle, talking about the Ark of the Covenant and the lid, which was called the mercy seat. That's one time. The other time we find it is in the book of Romans. But it's translated different. It's translated propitiation. Now, we don't use words like propitiation in our everyday language. I can't remember the last time I asked somebody, how's your propitiation doing lately? <laughs> this is not an everyday word. So let me define it for you. Mercy seat means propitiation. They're one and the same word, which means to turn away God's wrath by satisfying his violated justice. I got this definition from a book called The Miracle of the Scarlet Thread, Richard Booker. Great book, great author. If, uh, I think we have some in the bookstore. If you want to learn more about this, change your life. To turn away God's wrath by satisfying his violated justice. In other words, when God looked down from his throne in heaven and looked at the testimony of our hearts, he saw rejection and he saw rebellion and therefore judgment should have come. God would be just in that judgment that should have come to our lives. And yet God said, I want to be merciful, and therefore I will provide them a covering for sin through the blood of the sacrifice, an innocent life given for a guilty one. And this was showing what was going to go on in our hearts in the future. Because now Jesus comes as our great high priest. Remember, this is the main point of the things which we're saying is that we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens and gone into the Holy of Holies, not here on earth in a tabernacle made with hands, but into the presence of God Almighty Himself with His own blood. And He has sprinkled His blood on the mercy seat in heaven, and then He sat down at the right hand of God, having finished the work of redemption. Jesus made propitiation for our sins. He turned away God's wrath by satisfying His violated justice. That means when God looks down from heaven at the life of a believer, he no longer sees that rejection and that rebellion. He sees that we are covered in the blood of the Lamb and he sees Jesus on us. See, in the, in the Old Testament, atonement meant covering. In the New Testament, if you take a look at the word, it means something totally different. It means exchange. Remember that that seat without the mercy seat was a seat of judgment, but now it's exchanged for a seat of mercy. In the same way, when we receive Jesus into our life, we exchange our old man, that old sinner, that old dirty person, and we exchange our life for his life. Now we get Christ in our hearts, Christ in us, the hope of glory. We exchange our rags for his riches, our spots, our sins, our stains, for his perfect, spotless, sinless life. And now there's the great exchange that's been made. We have the life of God on the inside of us. Now remember, that word mercy seat's only used two times in the Bible. Turn me to the book of Romans. Back to the New Testament, the book of Romans. You guys okay? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Just checking. 
Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter number 3, we're talking about propitiation, talking about the mercy seat, turning away God's wrath by satisfying his violated justice. The book of Romans, the apostle Paul is writing, talking about how the righteousness of God through faith in Christ is on everybody who believes there's no difference. Everybody's messed up. Everybody's sinned. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3, verse number 24 comes along. It says this, being justified freely by his grace. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, that word justified means that the gavel of heaven has come down and has declared you and I to be not guilty. God says your sin is no longer counted against you. Now, there's an exchange that's been made. It's no longer you, but now it's Christ in you, and now you are not guilty. And we were justified freely by his grace. In other words, you cannot save yourself. You cannot behave well enough to get into heaven. It's not going to work like that. You do not have the strength. You do not have the power nor the ability to get yourself into heaven. God had to come down. God had to rescue you. God had to pull you out of the pit. It's his grace, his ability that does that. Through the redemption, the buying back. See, we were slaves to sin. And so Jesus came and he bought us out of that slavery. And he released us from that slavery. And now we are bound to Christ. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Everybody see those last two words? Can you read those with me? Christ Jesus. One more time. Christ Jesus. Verse 25, the first word is whom? Who are we talking about? Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth as a propitiation, a mercy seat. Jesus Christ is the covering of our lives. That when God looks down at our life, he no longer looks at the testimony of our heart that has rejected his provision, his leadership, and his laws. But now he sees the propitiation. He sees Christ by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. See, the sins were covered and God passed over them. And now in our life, it's no longer the Passover. It's no longer the, the covering. Now it's the exchange. I no longer am that old man. I'm not that old, sinful, dirty person. Now I'm a saint of the Almighty God. I am a child of God. Christ is in me. I am in him. And now I have a new life. God looks at your life and he's pleased. Because there was an innocent life, Jesus, that was given for a guilty one, all of us. Now Jesus has become our high priest. He's become so much greater. Jesus is the main point. And there's a couple of things. When you take a look at the testimony of our hearts, what are our hearts saying now? As believers, what is it that God sees when he looks in our hearts? Well, he still sees three things. Those same three things, as a matter of fact, because Jesus has become, number one, Jesus has become our new provision. We're not gathering manna anymore. We are going after Jesus. And anything that you have need of, you will find it in Christ Jesus. In fact, the Bible says that. It says, my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. How? By Christ Jesus. So you have a need in your life. Don't go look into a man. Don't go, go look into your bank account or a paycheck or your checkbook, anything like that. Don't look to your husband or wife for your provision. No, those are not your provision. Those are not your providers. God is your provider. And if you have a need, God already knows the need you have, but you've got to go to him. You've got to connect with him. And he who gathered little didn't gather too little. And he who gathered much didn't gather too much. See, when you get a hold of Jesus, if all you can get is just a little bit in the morning, maybe just a little bit of Jesus in the afternoon, maybe before you rest your head on your pillow at night, you get a little bit of Jesus in your Bible. Listen, that is enough for your day. But if you can get a lot of Jesus, if you can gather a lot of Jesus, you will never have too much. And you can rest in him for your everyday need. But listen, Jesus has also become something else. Jesus has become our new leadership. See, Jesus is now our direction. Jesus is our vision. Jesus is the captain of our salvation. He's gone out before us and he's saying, come on, saint, you can do it. Put your step there. Put your step there. Look out for that turn there. Watch out for the pitfall there. You're going to make it, child. See, we've got the greatest cheerleader. He is the 12th man. He is the one that's shouting on your behalf, saying, you can do this. Come on, believe me for great things. Follow my lead. And as you follow Jesus, don't take your eyes off him. He's your leadership. He's your direction. He's your vision. He is your wisdom. God will direct your life and you will go 
into amazing places and do amazing things. Finally, Jesus has become our new law. No longer are we bound by commandments written on tablets of stone. No, now it's written on our hearts. And Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you. See, he didn't, he didn't say that the Ten Commandments were bad. Those are still good, still very applicable. But now he says, the new commandment I give to you is the law of love. That you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You love your neighbor as yourself. See, if you do that, when you love God, you will not set up an image before him. You will not have an idol before him. You will set no other gods before him. God will be number one. He will be priority. He will be your everything. When you love God like that, you will fulfill those commandments. And when you love your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to murder. You're not going to steal. You're not going to commit adultery. Why? Because I love them. Why would I want to harm them? I'm in love, and therefore Jesus now is our new law. We don't need a, a, a million commandments telling us how to do each and everything, do's and don'ts and all that kind of stuff. No, we need to be, operate in the love of God. God is love. God is on the inside of us. Therefore, the love of God can pour forth from our lives, and we can do what God has called us to do and be what God has called us to be. So the testimony of our heart no longer condemns us, but now speaks of the blood of Jesus and the new covenant relationship we have with him. When we know this, we see why God spent all this time describing himself. Are you listening? That's why God made such a thick book is because God is a big God. And you can spend your entire life getting into this, studying this, learning this, going over this, and you will never, never exhaust the wisdom and the knowledge and the riches of God. You will just get a bigger and bigger and bigger picture of God on the inside. See, God's already as big as he's going to be. God's already magnificent and mighty and greater than the heavens and the earth. He, he's the one that stretched out the solar system. I mean, how big is God that he can stretch out the galaxies and the, and the universe before him? How big is your God? But see, on the inside of us, we think, oh, God's only this big. No, God is that big. And when I get into this, I get a bigger God. I get a bigger faith. I can believe God. My problems become this big. And now I can do what God has called me to do. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Come on, church. Let's give God a praise that he's worthy of. He's a great God. He's a big God. He's your God. Hallelujah. Woo. I so appreciate you guys. You guys were great today. And uh, I really believe that you got something from the word of God. Let's not stop there. I want to make sure that before you leave this place that your heart's right with God. And that if you were to die that you'd go to heaven and not go to hell. Now, sometimes people say, well, Pastor, I don't believe in hell. Well, that's a convenient way of thinking, but it's not the best way of thinking. Here's why. Because the Bible talks about hell, Old New Testament. In fact, Jesus spoke about hell, and therefore it's a very real place. And just by burying your head in the sand doesn't mean you're going to miss it. You're going to have to face the reality of it and make sure that you don't go there. God doesn't condemn us to hell. We get to choose with our lives where we go, whether heaven or hell. Now, sometimes people say, well, that's good because, you know, all roads lead to heaven. And, and God, you know, took care of that. And therefore, you stay true to yourself. I'll be true to myself. Those guys over there can do whatever they want to do. It doesn't matter. We're all going to make it to heaven. But do you know that nowhere in the Bible say that all roads lead to heaven? It doesn't work like that. Jesus came and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. What does that mean? That means it's God's heaven. You're going to have to get there God's way. And don't you think God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption, carried it out in his son Jesus, beaten, bloody, and hung on a cross. Don't you think if he went through all that, that he would tell us how to get to heaven? Well, he does here in his word. God's heaven, you're going to have to get there God's way. Now, sometimes people say, well, you know, I, I know that God lets good people into heaven. I've been good, done a lot of good deeds in my life. In fact, my good outweighs my bad. Used to be bad. Clean up my act. Now I'm good. And therefore, I'm going to get to go to heaven, give money to charities, help people out, nice to my neighbors. Good. God sees that, and God's going to let me to heaven. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible? Check it out. Nowhere. Nowhere. To say you can be good enough to get to heaven. Because just like we talked about in the message today, you cannot make it there on your own merit. You can't work hard enough to get there because the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. And all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're not going to make it to heaven by being good because you can't be good enough. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, I was raised in church. Parents told me we were Christians growing up. 
They hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck, had you baptized or christened as a child, took you to religious classes, Sunday school, Sabbath school, catechism class, had you baptized or christened. You're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist, Muslim, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, denying hell, right? Wrong. You know that nowhere in the Bible, check it out. Nowhere does it say that because you were raised in church, parents tell you you're Christian, that makes you a Christian. Nor in the Bible say that you wear religious jewelry, go to religious classes, be baptized or Christian as a child, or because you're born in America, that you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. And nowhere, check it out, nowhere do I see God looking at your life and saying, well, they're not any other religion, therefore he lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Today, let me love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. That's how you think you're going to get to heaven. You say, but pastor, not only when I was a child did I go to church. Here I am sitting in church in front of you right now. That's great. I'm glad you're here. Could you show that to me in the Bible? You sit in church service, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. That's like me going to my garage, sitting in my garage, call myself a car, and that makes me a car. Doesn't work like that. You can't sit in church, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. You say, but okay, I understand that, but my last church I got involved, I helped out, sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I taught in the Bible class. I even got a membership card to that church. That's great. I'm glad you did those things. Could you, could, could you just show that to me in the Bible where your church involvement gets you into heaven, makes you right with God? Where God says, do enough in church and you get to go to heaven. Listen, God is not looking for your membership card to a church or your attendance record to how many times you showed up to serve and then he lets you into heaven. You might be thinking, but I know God. I mean, I, I know about Jesus. I, I celebrate Christmas, sing the songs every year of my life, celebrate Easter and the resurrection. I could quote scriptures to you, Pastor. That's great. I'm glad you can do those things. Show that to me in the Bible where you have head knowledge about who Jesus is, knowing who he is in your head, celebrating a holiday, you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. In fact, if you read your Bible, you'd know demons believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God. They're not Christians. If you'd read your Bible, you would know that the devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures out of his mouth, and yet... That doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up at me here for a second. Not about what's in your head. Not about having mental assent towards God, knowing who he is or being able to quote some scriptures, but rather this is about your heart. We've been talking about this all day. What's in your heart? What have you done with your heart? See, Jesus came to a religious leader of his day who was a good guy, did a lot of good things, had it going on as far as we're concerned with what we're talking about, raised in church, got involved in church, attended church. He was a leader in the church. He taught people. He could quote the scripture. He could sing the scripture. How many of us could do that? And yet Jesus doesn't pat him on the back and say, keep doing what you're doing. I'll see you in heaven. No, what does he say? He says, you want to go to heaven? You must be born again. That's simple. One way. God tells us that way in John the third chapter. You must be born again. Again, now I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They've raked it to the coals, made it out to be something that's weirdo and crazy and all that kind of stuff. But listen, it's not about what society says or books or movies or television or Hollywood or the internet. It's about what the Bible says. What does being born again really mean from the Bible? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life. It's that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you in the book of Revelation. Last book in the Bible, Jesus is speaking to the church just like he's here speaking to this church today. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are graphic, pretty gross words from the mouth of Jesus. But what is he saying, lukewarm? What's that all about? Well, it's a little in, a little out. A little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not your everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today I'm going to give you an opportunity to give God all of your heart and to give God all of your life. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. Bang! Pop my hands together. When you hear that sound, bang! When I say three, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence now. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh huh. You might be embarrassed. Let's get past that today. Because think of the trade off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one make that trade. Yet the devil thinks you're dumb enough, so he's trying to talk you out of it. You tell that devil to go jump in a fiery lake. You go on with God. Listen. No one's judging. No one's criticizing. 
No one's condemning. We all love you. We all want you to do this. And in fact, we've all done it at one point or another in one way or another in our lives. So you're in good company. It's a safe and friendly place where you can give God all your heart and all of your life. And even if you're embarrassed, isn't that better than ending up in hell? Come on. Today, who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, today, make sure. This is your day of salvation. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never given God all your heart and all of your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. You can make a right relationship with God, acknowledging your need for Jesus right where you're at today. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching my television, the foyer, or the Love Rock Cafe, you can lift your hands and then tell an usher or come into the church service right afterwards. For those of you online, you can lift your hand and God is watching right where you're at. And then you can click the button that says respond to God and someone will lead you in a prayer. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go all together. One, two, Three, let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one. There's two. God bless you. Who else? Three. Thank you. Four. God bless you. Up on top, is, there, is that a hand up there? Thank you. Five. God bless you. Who else today? Six over here. Gotcha. Six. Is that a hand up there? Wave it at me if it is. Okay. It's not. Thank you. Seven. God bless you. Who else today? Seven wise people already. Anybody else real quick? Seven. There's eight. There's nine up in the family rooms. God bless you guys. Who else today? We're at number 10. Thank you. Number 10. Got you right here. Number 10. Who else today? Real quick, come on. Just pop it up. Back back there, thank you. There's 11, 12, God bless you. Dozen wise people. Anybody else real quick that I didn't already see? Right over here. Wave it at me if I didn't see you yet. Okay? They're all going this way. Got you right there. Thank you, number 13. Who else today? Who else today? Number 13. Number 13. Anybody else real quick that I didn't already see? Up top, thank you. 14, God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? Come on. Come on, if that's you, just pop it up when I'm looking in your direction. Anybody else? Come on, number 15. You're sitting there wondering if you should. Yeah, you should. Go for it. God's tugging at your heart. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 14 white people. Hallelujah. Now, everybody, I want to thank you guys for allowing us to do that because if we didn't do that, there would have been 14 wise people that would have walked out of this place thinking that they were right with God, and if they would have died, would have went to hell. But thank you for allowing us to do that and for believing God with us for people to respond. Now, listen, you don't get saved just by raising your hand. You've got to give God all your heart. You've got to give God all of your life. So in a moment, we're all going to stand and give a clap and a shout. As we do, no one leaves because we're trying to get people to come forward. We want to change destinies today. Okay, so if that's you, you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand. Once you get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Once you get in the aisle and meet us up front because we're going to change destinies today, but we can't do that until we get you down here. So let's all stand and welcome them. You come right now. If you raise your hand, you should have raised your hand. You come. Just make your way to the front right now. They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. You can come too. From the family rooms, bring your children with you. They'll remember this. You just come on down. Come on down. They're coming. They're coming. This is your time. This is your moment. You can come too. Come on down. Come on down. Come on down. They're still coming. Come on. Let's give the Lord a praise. You can come too. Just make your way to the front right now. Anybody else? Come on down. Hey, guys, thank God you guys have come. Now, listen, I don't think everybody came, and, and that's a shame, but you know what? I, I can't make you come. But listen, if you raised your hand or you should have, but, and you know you need to be here, while I'm giving some instructions, it's still not too late. You can come down, and you can join this group up front, okay? You guys, right here, look over here to my right, your left. See this guy waving at you, looks kind of like me. He just forgot the tie, just like Elijah did. I don't know what, how they missed the memo today, but anyways, he's a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on, okay? He's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. Then he's going to give you some free information, some free literature that will help you to find out what, you do, what to do next in your walk with God, okay? It's, it's free, easy reading, okay? And it'll just help you to get your bearings. What, what do I do now that I'm a Christian, okay? And then finally, he's going to give you a friend that we have here in the church. Yeah, we give away friends here at The Rock, okay? And we call them spiritual personal trainers. It's easy, it's free. He'll describe how it works, and then he'll let you come right back out. Now listen, give us a year here at The Rock. 
just sitting under the word of God. At the end of that year, for the rest of your life, you're going to be so blessed. You're going to be like, man, I didn't know it could be like this. All right? It all starts with that spiritual personal trainer, that friend in church who will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. So he's going to take you right over there, and then I'll let you come right back out. Your friends will wait for you. Let's give a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Woo. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.